Hello. Welcome to the webinar on colliding interests in Eurasia, the South Caucasus, the Belt and Road, and COVID-19. Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending on where you are. I'm Casey Kuo, Director of the Asia Global Fellows Program at the Asia Global Institute of the University of Hong Kong. This webinar is the fourth one in a series of webinars that are designed to bring our Asia Global Fellows from around the world to have a dialogue on important global policy issues. Our earlier webinars have covered India, Latin America, and Africa. The South Caucasus lies between the East and the West and plays a key geopolitical and security role in Eurasia. It is a region where the interests of Russia, the EU, the US, Turkey, and Iran converge and often collide. China has also been building political and economic relations with the region while investing in this important crossroad through its Belt and Road Initiative. How are these geopolitical forces playing out and what are the challenges the region faces in the context of COVID-19? Let's hear from our Asia Global Fellows from the South Caucasus, their on-the-ground perspectives. Our moderator today is Ms. Vera Kubalia. Vera is a former Minister of Economy and Sustainable Development and advisor to the President of Georgia. I shall leave it to Georgia to introduce our two panel speakers, Mayor and Nona. Over to you, Rob, uh, Vera. Thank you, Casey. Welcome everyone to Asia Global Institute's webinar series. Today, we will be talking about the countries of South Caucasus, Georgia and Armenia, the power play in the region, the role of China and the Belt and Road Initiative, and of course, all of it in the context of COVID-19. We have two fantastic speakers with us today and I'm lucky to be moderating the conversation. As Casey mentioned, I'm the former Minister of Economy of Georgia, and I'm also a proud alumni of the Asia Global Fellows. Dr. Mher Sahakyan is the Director of China Eurasia Council for Political and Strategic Research and Asia Global Fellow for 2020-2021 at the Asia Global Institute. He holds a doctorate in international relations from Nanjing University. We also have Ms. Nona Mamalashvili with us, and she's the founder and chairwoman of the Caucasus Economic Policy Institute. She's also president of the Georgian Swiss Business Association, vice president of the Union of Businesswomen of Georgia, as well as an associate professor of international relations at the International Black Sea University. Previously, Ms. Mamalashvili worked for a number of Fortune 500 companies, and she holds a PhD in international relations and diplomacy from the Center of Diplomatic and Strategic Studies in Paris, France. So you can see that we have uh, an excellent um, uh, group of speakers today. So when it comes to Georgia and Armenia, Georgia, as many of you know, uh, went through a revolution which was called the Rose Revolution in 2003. And Armenia just two years ago uh, had its own uh, Velvet Revolution. This um, deep frustration with entrenched politics and poor living standards led to mass public demonstrations and political changes that brought reformist leaders to power. So what uh, we're interested uh, to hear today are, is how these countries fared since the revolutions, considering the geographical locations between less than democratic regional powers of Russia Iran and Turkey. But we should probably start with a bit of history and culture of these countries to really understand where we are coming from. So let me pass uh, the conversation to Dr. Mher so he can tell us a bit about the current context in Armenia. Thank you. Dear Ms. Kobalia, thank you very much for this introduction and special thanks go to 
uh, Mr. Kvok and uh, Asia Global Institute team for organizing this very important and in interesting, interesting discussion. Can you see my PowerPoint presentation? Okay, and I will start. The South Caucasus is located in a strategically uh, important crossroad with its vast sources of oil, gas, metals, and drinking water. Throughout this region, Russia tries to move towards Middle East and the Persian Gulf. Turkey tries to be connected with Azerbaijan and Central Asia and Turkic language uh, speaking states. Iran tries to reach Black Sea through the region. Europe goes towards East uh, and China moves towards Western Asia and Europe. During the last years of the existence of the Soviet Union, territorial disputes between different nationalities, which had also some historical roots are to large scale military clashes. As a result, the conflict, the conflict between Armenia and Artsakh, which was trying to disintegrate from Soviet Union and Azerbaijan Soviet Socialist Republic erupted. This military conflict ended by de facto creation of new statehood in South Caucasus, but the negotiation for, with some interruption for the final, the jure status of Artsakh are still going on between Armenia and Azerbaijan, where Russia, US, and uh, France uh, 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 are involved as co-chairs of Minsk Group, which was created by the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe. The internal situation in uh, Georgia was also not stable, as there were also several uh, interethnic clashes. These all developments disintegrated economic interconnection of the region and created a stable political situation which provided an opportunity to external pl players uh, to interfere. Let's, uh, uh, let's also, uh, here is Stepan Aker, capital of Artsakh, and uh, let's also discuss Russian factor in the South Caucasus. Russian politicians still see South Caucasus as the region where Russia has enough capabilities for keeping its position. In Artsakh conflict, Russia uh, tried to play a natural role as it is trying to keep good relations with Armenia and Azerbaijan, which is giving Moscow some influence and leverages during the negotiation problem for solving this problem. It is worth mentioning that Armenia is a military ally of Russia, and uh, Moscow has also military base in the second biggest Armenian city, Gyumri. These pictures are from there, and, uh, and, uh, and air base in Yerevan. Armenia is a member of Russian leader, Russian Economic Union and the Collective Security Treaty Organization. Armenia needs Russia for keeping its Western border safe from Azerbaijani main LA, Turkey. And Russia needs Armenia, which stops ambitions of some Turkish politicians to create pan-Turkic state, which aims to include Turkey, Azerbaijan, Central Asia, and Xinjiang. Russia has also created strategic partnership with Azerbaijan, Moscow is the main supplier of arms to Azerbaijan, and this factor is making some problems in Russo-Armenian relations. Russo-Georgian note is it relations are totally harmed uh, because of the war between Georgia and uh, on one side and Abkhazia and South Ossetia from the other side in 2008, when the last two got military full support from Russia. In some, Russia still plays especially important role in uh, South Caucasus as it is involved in regional conflicts. Moscow will try to keep status quo in South Caucasus or find ways for political changes in Georgia, which will, bake, uh, which will help to bake it to Russian political camp. Let's also discuss the U.S. factor in South Caucasus. After the collapse of Soviet Union, U.S. developed its uh, relations with South Caucasus states and strengthened its position in this region. The U.S. have created strategic partnership with Georgia and involved it in its political economic camp. Getting some uh, support from the U.S., former uh, President Mikhail Saakashvili removed Russian military bases from Georgia. Until now, Moscow has historically minimal influence in uh, Georgian uh, uh, internal politics. In national security concept of uh, Georgia, it is stated. One of Georgia's main foreign and security policy priorities is membership in NATO. Therefore, the expansion eastward of NATO is important for Georgia. These same clashes with Russia's interests 
which tries to stop NATO's extensions, as Russia sees it as a challenge for its national security. Actually, for cooperation with the US and aspiration to stand a member of the NATO, Georgia paid remarkably high price and lost its uh, control over Abkhazia and South Caucasus when Moscow recognized them as an independent state. It is worth mentioning that after the war between Russia and Georgia, the US provided 1 billion aid to Georgia, which was especially significant for keeping stability in Georgia. Tbilisi also enjoys preferential trade regime with the US with special tariffs. Washington has normal relations with Armenia and Azerbaijan as well, especially Armenia lobbying groups actively work in US. As a result of this war, on December 12, 2019, US Senate recognized Armenian genocide. But as Armenia is a military ally of Russia and a member of the Eurasian Economic Union, Armenian-American relations have limited uh, agenda on a state-to-state -state level. Building strong relations with the US is important for Azerbaijan as well, as several US companies invest in oil and gas production sectors of Azerbaijan, and US tries, uh, uses the territory of Azerbaijan for sending its troops to Afghanistan. In sum, the US will continue its policy to finance and support political parties in the region, which will help to weaken Russian influence in the region and move countries into West Western camp. So Caucasus sta states will continue to use their ties with the US for balancing powers in the region. Let's also discuss uh, the, the EU factor in so South Caucasus. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, the European Union initiated transport corridor, Europe, Caucasus, Asia, project which aims to connect Europe with South Caucasus and Asia without passing through Russian territory. The EU initiated also Eastern Partnership for deepening and strengthening uh, relations with Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, and uh, other non-regional states. Nowadays, Georgia's major foreign policy priority is to stand member of the European Union. In 2014, Georgia signed the association agreement with the European Union, which include, includes the deep and comprehensive free trade area. In turn, Armenia values its relations with the European Union and tries to strengthen cooperation with it. For this reason, in 2017, Armenia-EU Comprehensive and Enhanced Partnership Agreement was signed. EU is interested in cooperation, cooperation with Azerbaijan for getting energy sources as EU sees Azerbaijan oil and gas as an alternative to Russian energy sources. For this reason, many European countries invest in gas and oil fields of Azerbaijan. It is worth mentioning that for a long time, EU has been supporting states of South Caucasus to implement reforms in the spheres of economy, justice and public administration. After the collapse of Soviet Union, mostly by the help of EU, democratic societies and institutions for protecting human rights, freedom of speech were built in Armenia and Georgia. As a result, these two states transformed from into democratic states. In South Caucasus, only Azerbaijan remains autocratic states, where after the collapse of the Soviet Union for already 27 years, Aliyev's family has established the dictatorship. Let's also speak about Turkish and Iranian uh, factors in South Caucasus. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, the following reasons unite Turkey and Azerbaijan again. Cooperation in political, military, economic, energy spheres. In these relations, serious attention is paid to the cooperation in energy sphere. Azerbaijani-Turkish relations, Azerbaijani uh, decision makers like to introduce as one state, as one nation, two states, taking into consideration the fact that they share common language and genealogy with, genealogy with Turkish side. Actually, Turkey has huge influence in Azerbaijan as it provides Azerbaijan with full support against Armenia and it unilaterally closed Turkish-Armenian border for baking Azerbaijan. In turn, Georgia has good relations with Turkey. This state signed free trade agreement and Turkey is the second trade partner of Georgia. After the dissolution of the Soviet Union, Iran also established uh, diplomatic relations with Armenia, Georgia and Azerbaijan 
For now, Iran lim has limited capabilities in South Caucasus, as for a long time, it was under the heavy sanctions of United Nations Security Council, EU, and, uh, and for now, the US imposed new unilateral sanctions on Iran. However, South Caucasus states tried to keep political and economic normal cooperation with Iran as uh, far as sanction, sanctions allow. And let's go to Chinese factor and speak about uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, for, the recent, uh, for the recent years, China has been trying to develop its relation with Armenia, Georgia, and Azerbaijan in the framework of Belt and Road Initiative. China has already invested several hundred millions in Georgia and in Azerbaijan, and there is no any big Chinese investments in Armenia. From the South Caucasus, Georgia and Azerbaijan are regional members, and Armenia is a prospective member of Asian Invest, uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank. Representatives of Georgia and Azerbaijan are also included in board of governors of this bank. In 2016, for instance, in 2016, November, Azerbaijan succeeded to receive 600, uh, 600 million from the bank to build uh, uh, a trans-Anatolian gas pipeline. And Georgia received 114 million from the bank to build a B pass road. It is worth mentioning that Georgia and China signed a free trade agreement on uh, 2017, based on which 94% uh, of Georgian goods imported to, in, to China are sector, accepted from taxes. South Caucasus is one of the important links in, uh, in China, Central Asia, Western Asia economic corridor from which China goes west. It should be noted that Georgia and Azerbaijan strengthened their position in this corridor when in October 2017, they jointly with Turkey launched Baku Tbilisi Cars Railway. One of the roads of China, Central Asia, Western Asia economic corridor passes from Chinese Xinjiang, Central Asia, and Kazakh Port of Aktau, or Turkmenistan is Turkmenbashi International Seaport, through the Caspian Sea, reaches Azerbaijan in Baku port, and after it connects with the Baku Tbilisi Kars Railway. And where for Turkey goes to the Europe and Mediterranean Sea. It is also worth mentioning that the transportation of goods from uh, China to Europe, from China, Central Asia, Western Asia economic corridors, uh, uh, link uh, can last from 15 to 20 days. Taking into consideration Russo-Ukrainian tense relations, for instance, Kiev tries to be past the Russian control, new Eurasian land bridge, giving preference to opportunities provided by China, Central Asia, Western Asia economic corridor. Cargo transportation from China to Ukraine is being implemented for China, Kazakhstan, Caspian Sea, uh, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Black Sea direction. In turn, Armenia is building its uh, 556 kilometer north-south road corridor, which aims to connect ports in Pershangal with Georgian ports in Black Sea. Uh, the anticipated space of the project is 1 billion 500, uh, uh, 1, 1 billion 500 billion dollars. And I have some uh, policy recommendations and I will finish. Uh, Armenia can try to play uh, the role of a mediator in normalization, rela normalizing relations between Georgia and Russia. In Armenia, high level meet meetings between Russian and Georgian decision makers can be organized for improving relations between the two states. The second recommendation, in turn, Georgia can use its good relations with Armenia and Azerbaijan and try to play a role of peace builder in South Caucasus. And third one, Russia and China can submit resolution in the United Nations Security Council, which will impose arms embargo on site, which are in, involved in Artsakh or uh, so-called uh, Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. As a result, the arms race between Azerbaijan and Armenia will be stopped, and Nagorno-Karabakh conflict will be solved in peaceful way. In turn, China will get an opportunity to make vast investment in this region without any risk. The fourth uh, recommendation, Azerbaijan must face the reality that people of Artsakh chose the right of self-determination and stop any attempt to solve the dispute through military actions. 
uh, and the next next recommendation, South Caucasus states can establish joint center for sharing their experience on struggle against COVID-19, which will help to build transworthy relations. And the last recommendation, the EU and the US must continue their constructive role for which they are helping to implement democratic transportation uh, transformation of the states of the South Caucasus. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sahakan. Um, well, as we can see, this is a, a complex region with a significant number of players and uh, colliding interests. Uh, before we have Nona speak, I just wanted to remind everyone that um, we will be taking questions. Um, so please, I encourage you to start thinking about the questions that uh, you would like to have answers uh, from uh, Nona and her and myself. Um, you can send your questions uh, via the Zoom Q&A box, but you can also do so through the Facebook page and the uh, great team at AGI will share those questions with us um, uh, as we speak. Um, so now, Nona, please, uh, we would love to hear from you. Thank you very much, uh, Her. Thank you for the presentation and thanks for partially covering Georgia. You stole my thunder, uh, but I will try to make it up. Uh, so um, again, I would like to thank the Asia Global Institute for organizing uh, this event because uh, uh, South Caucasus seems to become a region of the interest and uh, and for the for the global players. And it is uh, right. Uh, it, it is very timely that we are speaking about uh, we're speaking about the interest of the regional powers and interest of the global powers in the South Caucasus. So why the South Caucasus has become so interesting. But first I wanted to show you a little bit of the uh, cultural part uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the South Caucasus or of mostly Georgia, uh, because for those who haven't seen it, uh, I would like just to show because I'm so proud of the, of the sightseeing that we have in Georgia and the breathtaking landscape that uh, it would be nice to show to share with you some, uh, some for so let me try and share my presentation, uh, which will be very, very short. And uh, let's see. Okay, uh, so hold on. So as, as Mher already uh, told us uh, or showed you, uh, the South Caucasus is located here in between, in between uh, it is sandwiched in between Russia uh, Turkey and Iran, and two seas, the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. So um, the, the chain of the mountains, it is the greater and the lesser Caucasus mountains, are the, uh, one of the world's great mountain ranges and, and the home to the highest peaks in Europe. Uh, so Georgia, as I mentioned, it has very panoramic views and uh, uh, very beautiful landscapes. For those who are interested to visit, you are definitely welcome. So you can see that you can enjoy a lot of beautiful sightseeing in Georgia. Uh, the uh, 12th, 11th to 12th century cave city, which is an amazing place to visit. Uh, we have the, uh, the villages in the high mountains uh, and uh, Georgia is very famous for its, uh, for, for its mountains uh, and uh, naturally we have, the, we have the sea and the sea resorts. Uh, so those who enjoy the extreme sports can of course enjoy the, uh, the skiing in Georgia and also uh, enjoy the Black Sea um, uh, beaches. So this is the capital called Tbilisi and uh, the capital uh, is, uh, uh, the capital has very distinct uh, architecture which is very specific to Georgia, but it is a fusion of modern and the futuristic architecture. So um, our um uh, previous president was uh, very keen in uh, in in uh, actually uh, creating the fusion of the modern and uh, and the ancient architecture. And you can see Tbilisi is amazingly beautiful city for those who want to who want to visit. Uh, you uh, may enjoy the city and uh, and all the other and all the other beautiful places in Georgia. And don't worry, it's not very cold in Georgia. Georgia enjoys the uh, continental climate, and in some places we even have the subtropical climate. So. Uh, 
uh, please come and visit and enjoy. So, um, but apart from this, the most important one is that Georgia is the birthplace of wine. So uh, Georgia, uh, the, the, the first traces of the wine production were traced back to 8,000 years. So if you would like to enjoy the genuine wine, please come and visit and try this one in Georgia. So you'll enjoy it. Uh, now, now, we have seen, we, as I said, uh, there are a number of regional players, uh, Turkey, Armenia, Turkey, uh, excuse me, uh, Iran and, uh, and Russia. And we have the big players that came later on. We we have the European Union, we have um, United States, and the latest comer in, is China. So uh, let's see how all those players are uh, playing their great game in the Caucasus and what is the place uh, of the Caucasus in this, of the South Caucasus in this game. So with this, I will stop uh, sharing my presentation and uh, I will continue with my uh, with my speech rather. Uh, so as I said, the, the South Caucasus is sandwiched between the, uh, I, I stopped the uh, presentation, right Vera? Yes. 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 Okay. So the South Caucasus is sandwiched between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, uh, and uh, it is it is a region that includes uh, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. It is and it is home, as I said, to the Lesser Caucasus and the Greater Caucasus and the highest peaks in Europe. So the sea history of the Caucasus since the collapse of the Soviet Union has been uh, very turbulent, but uh, the countries are reasonably stable now, and uh, the sea institutions are are maturing slowly but uh, steadily. So the region is, uh, however highly fragile and, and democracy where it exists uh, is not very deeply rooted. So surrounded by Russia, Turkey and, and Iran, uh, South Caucasus became, uh, let's say, the buffer zone and the, the, the battlefield between the great powers. So the risk of the turmoil among, uh, uh, among the, the, the immediate neighborhood of, uh, of Europe remains quite high. So uh, all of the three countries have ge different geostrategic trajectories. Uh, and uh, Georgia remains, uh, Georgia's perception uh, of, the, of the trajectory is Western and pre-European. So so for Georgia, the primary threat comes from Russia, which still occupies 20% of the Georgian territory, and uh, the Russian troops are stationed about 40 miles from the capital. So ever since the collapse of the Soviet Union, Georgia, as I said, was um, is uh, and still is in the Western in spirit and attitude, uh, and is playing is playing the rebalancing game between the between the uh, great powers in order to counter the Russian threat. So Iran, Turkey, EU, US, they all have their share of interest in the Caucasus, uh, but over the past years, China has um uh, shown uh, has uh, emerged on the on the scene with its still evolving Belt and Road Initiative, and it is slowly emerging in the Caucasus. So I will go one by one through the regional players, and I will try to be a br as brief as possible and as objective as possible to see what are the interests of the regional powers in the South Caucasus and how South Caucasus is uh, is presenting itself in this game. So uh, naturally, I will start with Russia, which is our biggest threat. So Russia appeared in the region. Uh, um, in the 16th, mid 16th century, but it uh, established their uh, hegemony in the Caucasus from the 19th century. So uh, traditionally and naturally, as it is due to Russia, with the aim of consolidating the hold of the Caucasus, Russia uh, is fueling the hostility among the local players. And in general, their traditional and classical divide and rule is the preferred tactic to ensure the imperial peace. So the Soviet Russia and Putin's Russia continue this tradition. So, uh, in the South Caucasus, Russia has most difficult and problematic relationship with Georgia because uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Georgia's effort to build the closer ties with the US and the EU and, uh, and the country's drive to join NATO and Euro-Atlantic structures basically frustrated and infuriated Russia. So Russia is using the coercive and manipulative tactics in Georgia in order to punish the disobedient state. Russia is using the economic, political, or military levers. For instance, they, by introducing the visa, discriminatory visa regime, or cutting the gas supplies right in the middle of the winter, introducing the embargoes for the Georgian products. So Putin's foreign policy towards South Caucasus and generally towards the former Soviet, uh, Soviet states is, um, is driven mostly by one single goal. He wants to rebuild the greater Russia and reestablish the control uh, over the geographic area, which he considers to be his proper. Uh, so, but 
but he realizes that the Soviet Union cannot come back and he cannot rebuild it. So Russia uh, tries to play, as I said, um, a divide and, and rule game. Uh, and uh, tries to uh, have the, uh, to enjoy the all dominant influence and hegemony uh, in the region. So the next big player here is Iran. Uh, Iran's foreign policy towards Caucasus is uh, basically to diminish the Western influence in the region. So Tehran's world policy is based mostly on the pragmatism. It is seeking ways to build uh, the ties with the South Caucasus while uh, placing the special emphasis on the stability. It is very important that the Caucasus is stable for Tehran. Georgia has uh, the least developed relationship with Iran among South Caucasus states, but Georgia has very pragmatic views of the cooperation with, with, with Iran because uh, Iran could be, uh, because Georgia tries to diminish its energy dependence on Russia and Iran could be an alternative. Uh, so uh, another big player, a regional player that we have uh, and which is very important is Turkey. Because Turkey is strategically important because uh, it acts as a natural link uh, between the Caucasus, Central Asia, Balkans and the Gulf region. And Turkey is also the, the gateway to the energy resources and the oil pipelines in the neighborhood. So however, it is wrong to assume that Turkey uh, shares the Western approach in policies uh, to the region and the, on the number of occasions Turkey has demonstrated the strategic and regional uh, autonomy that is sometimes very different from the US and EU goals in the region. So unlike a relationship with Armenia, uh, Turkey has a, a very strong and vital relationship with Georgia and Azerbaijan. So there are a number of energy and communication projects uh, that our countries um, are pushing forward and, and are cooperating on. So these regional projects, of course, they include the uh, crude oil and natural gas pipelines and the railway connection. Both Azerbaijan and Georgia consider um, Turkey as the link to West and Western structures such as NATO. So uh, Turkey is one of our biggest trading partners and uh, we do have the visa-free regime. Our citizens can travel through the borders with basically the domestic identity documents. Uh, and um, let me say a few words about the EU. Uh, EU uh, has joined the mix of actors and organizations in the South Caucasus in the late 90s because uh, EU was busy with, the, with its immediate neighborhood and the conflict in the Balkans. So EU was not uh, looking to the South Caucasus, which, it, which EU at that period considered as the uh, Russian backyard. Uh, however, the picture is considerably different today. EU has significantly increased the footprint in the region and it's uh, it's deepening the ties with the region, well, on a different level with different countries. Uh, but uh, we have we have seen uh, the, the the increased interest. So the number of factors led to this um, increased engagement in the region. And the first of all, it was um, the mass. In, uh, the, 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 the the first of all, the three states wanted to develop the relationship with EU in order to uh, counter the Russian influence in the region. Secondly, uh, with the with the enlargement uh, and inclusion of Romania and Bulgaria, the South Caucasus became geographically closer to the EU. And uh, the third point is when Georgia had the Rose Revolution in two thousand three. Uh, our uh, a third president um, declared that his foreign policy priority is Euro-Atlantic integration, which was another um, uh, another factor that led more to more interest from the EU uh, structures towards Georgia. And finally, and most importantly, it's energy. So uh, EU wants to secure the uh, the energy routes uh, bypassing Russia, and Azerbaijan, with its vast gas resources, has taken the key role for the uh, to, in order to diversify the natural resources for the. Um, the EU strategy in the Caucasus is a long term, which is uh, directed to create the political and economic environment, which is secure at its borders. Uh, and um, uh, now regarding the US interests in the region, US came again, um, uh, in US is another latecomer to the region. For, for the US after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, they were actually treating the region as non-country specific, but uh, in the 90s, uh, US policy was mostly aimed to prevent, uh, to, to help construct the market economies and, and, and promote the democracy. Uh, however, in the mid-90s, when the 
Caspian uh, oil boom gave uh, the region a very uh, the big significance. Uh, uh, the e and the energy supplies to Europe started to flow. Uh, the U.S. Um, uh, U.S. became the part of the of the game, and the concept of the wider Black Sea region uh, was uh, was created, which incorporated the South Caucasus, uh, Bulgaria, Romania. Uh, Ukraine, uh, Moldova, mm, Russia, and Turkey, and um, uh, but however, uh, after the, the 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 biggest interest from the U.S. was seen after the terrorist attack in 2009-11, uh, so the American-led global war on the terror uh, and the Caucasus was critical as the military strategic um, launchpad for the U.S. military forces en route to Middle East and Afghanistan. And it was also seen as the threat for the possible source of the radicalized Islam, especially the northern part of Georgia. So the three states uh, supported the United States in this new reality post 9-11, and they offered to use their airspace in the operations uh, for freedom in Afghanistan. So, um, but because uh, the, the regional powers, Turkey, Iran, and, and Russia became more uh, influential in the region uh, with the time passing by, they started to, to, to play more assertive politics, to politics towards South Caucasus. So this forced the American policy to become more tailored and differentiated. And finally, the last latecomer to the region is China. Uh, for the last 15 years, Chinese are improving their positions in the Caucasus and they are investing heavily. They are giving non-payable, uh, non-repayable loans and they're enhancing the trade relations. So uh, let me uh, just uh, show you the, uh, the just, uh, just read you the numbers which are showing the best, uh, the, Chinese, um, the Chinese increased interest. So in 2005, the balance, uh, the trade balance between China and Azerbaijan uh, was uh, 273 million. The balance between 2005, I'm talking about, the balance between Armenia and, uh, and China was 52 million. Uh, and uh, the balance between Georgia and, uh, and uh, China was 74 million. So today, uh, what we're seeing, uh, the, the trade balance between China and, uh, and Azerbaijan is 2.2 billion. Uh, the trade balance with the Armenia is 945 million. And the trade balance with Georgia is 1.5 billion. So roughly, the increase is about 1,100%. Uh, of uh, between those three countries. So uh, for Georgia, China is the third largest trade partner. Uh, in 2017, we have signed the free trade agreement with China. Uh, Georgia also hopes to uh, position itself uh, or its uh, Black Sea region with several ports as a logistic hub for the entire region, which would be interesting for the China's BRI initiative. Um, China is also exerts the soft power in the Caucasus, and it consists of the cultural and educational projects and technical assistance, uh, and naturally the Confucius Institute. Uh, for instance, in Georgia, the Confucius Institute was established in 2010. So uh, we have about 26 universities and schools in Georgia that are offering the Chinese language courses. Um, about 30 students from Georgia are traveling to China every year. Uh, and the, the scholarship is paid by the Chinese government and uh, the students are studying in Chinese universities. Um, we have about 20 teachers uh, and volunteers from China coming to Georgia every year to teach the Chinese, uh, Chinese language uh, in Georgia. And um, our governments have signed an agreement on the popularizing the Chinese culture and language in Georgia. So unlike Russia or Western state, China does not have its own media project in South Caucasus. There is no Chinese sponsored media outlet uh, that is broadcasting in local language and projects the Chinese perspective on the domestic and regional affairs. So, uh, in the conclusion, uh, what I can say, although China's soft power in the Caucasus is weaker uh, if compared to the, to the other external actors, Beijing is showing the increased interest and economic presence in the region. Uh, China is um, you know, restrained and it is cautioned and it's mostly targeting the elites. It is not influencing the wider public, uh, but economic involvement continues to grow. Uh, we will probably see more cultural and educational efforts uh, from China in the South Caucasus. Uh, and uh, the elites of our countries, they see China as an alternative to Russia and the West for the economic uh, cooperation. 
uh, China doesn't have the negative history in the region, therefore, and it does not uh, request uh, the uh, it does not request the uh, political participation in any alliances or domestic reforms. So uh, these circumstances they serve China to place uh, they they serve China China's soft power in the Caucasus in the positive light. As for the American and European goals in the region, um, they are broadly identical. So it's preventing the anti-Western orientation, opening markets improving the rule of law and diversifying the extraction and the transportation of the hydrocarbons and promoting the regional stability in the region. So with this, I am done with my presentation uh, and I'm open to questions. Thank you, Nona. That was a really comprehensive look at uh, uh, the history, the culture, but also uh, the geopolitical context of Georgia and South Caucasus and what and how all the players collided the region. Um, so we've looked uh, quite a bit into the history and I wanted to now uh, dig deeper into the current context and also look into the future. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, Georgia um, had its uh, Rose Revolution in 2003 and since then, it was referred as the beacon of democracy in the region. And as you can see from the presentations by uh, Per and Nona, that this region is not really known, um, especially the big players in the region, for its democratic values. Um, and of course, Armenia had uh, a revolution uh, just two years ago. And, um, all eyes were um, on Armenia at the time. And um, these um, uh, revolutions were mainly uh, coming uh, from the people asking uh, to uh, deal with the corruption. And uh, corruption uh, at the institutional level uh, at, uh, and the state corruption. Uh, for the Russian state, acknowledgement that a post-Soviet country can be free of corruption and in parallel grow its economy at double digits um, is uh, also acknowledgement of its own failure. So what I wanted to ask both of you is uh, now that we see Belarus and what is happening in the streets of Belarus over the last couple of weeks, um, what has Armenia and Georgia learned from their revolutions uh, how they have changed uh, the countries and um, how Russia has um, um, played in the region after those revolutions and what can countries, post-Soviet countries such as Belarus, uh, learn uh, from Georgia and Armenia's experience um, and um, what is the future uh, for Georgia and Armenia in that context? So uh, maybe we start with Nona this time. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Vera. Uh, so, um, what we have learned from the from the revolutions and uh, how the, our country has developed after after the peaceful revolution in two thousand three, and how Russia has been engaged and involved. Well, uh, what we have seen is that um, Georgia was a failed state at the beginning of the, the end of the nineties. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, Georgia was one of the most corrupt countries, uh, and uh, the weakest economic performances uh, indicators were uh, very specific specific to Georgia. Um, when uh, the revolution happened, in, the peaceful revolution happened in 2003 and the new government came, uh, they actually inherited the failed state, uh, failed corrupt state. Uh, so they needed the radical changes and the new government was ready for the radical changes. Uh, so the changes that were introduced by the new government basically uh, had impacted, um, and I will not, not go through the, all the details of, of the changes, but that has the, that has impacted the Georgia's uh, perspective. Georgia was put back on the map for the international players. Georgia was referred as the best uh, reformer in the region. Uh, and it was an example to the other uh, former Soviet countries that it is possible uh, to turn from the failed corrupt state into the uh, democratic state with the developing institutions uh, to basically uproot the corruption at the highest level uh, and uh, and uh, 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 show and present the country as the best example of um, 
of the reforms. So, uh, of course, this frustrated Russia. Of course, Russia was unhappy to see uh, the region that was developing, uh, the region that was uh, developing its democratic institutions. Russia does not have the friends in establishment, so Russia supports the anti-establishment. And we have seen uh, the provocations from Russia uh, during all this period. Russia has tried to uh, the, bring back the, uh, the, the, um, the conflict, uh, the, uh, the, the instability in the region, and, uh, and it, it has provoked the, in 2008, we have seen that it has ended in the conflict that when Russia, uh, when Russia attacked Georgia in 2008, uh, it was not only because um, you know, Russia was protecting its citizens, Russia wanted Georgia to fail. Russia wanted to, uh, to destroy the example for the other countries. And this was one of the, one of the reasons why the Russian military appeared in Georgia, which, which, uh, which was the military that was prepared here for years and years in advance. Her, would you like to add from yes, Armenian thank perspective? You. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, uh, Nona already answered in the best way, but I will try to make some comments. Of course, uh, Armenian and Georgian uh, revolution can stand a good example for Belarusians as well. Uh, if we speak about Russia during the Armenian revolution, uh, Russia was not involved. And afterward, Armenia and Russia could uh, keep their good relation, as it is not about the relations of government, but about the relations of two nations. And uh, I think that uh, uh, there is no any need to mention that uh, even if uh, the government in Armenia or Russia will be changed, Ar Armenians and Russians will try to keep, will try to keep their good relations because we are military allies and we have interests together. Thank you. So we have a number of questions coming in from uh, the listeners. Um, and um, I'll start uh, with the first question, which brings in uh, China into the conversation. So you both, of course, spoke about the role of China and uh, Belt and Road Initiative and the types of uh, investments over the last couple of years and the trade balance. Um, so the question is from David Morris. And um, he's asking, I'm interested in whether you think the Belt and Road Initiative can contribute stability through establishing new infrastructure and connectivity to provide development, or does it introduce geopolitical destabilizing factors? And are there examples of both? Mm -hmm. So if you can maybe even uh, go a bit broader and uh, look at, um, uh, the China uh, role in the South Caucasus over the last couple of years and um, its um, power play in context of other big players uh, of Russia and US and how and what we can anticipate over the last um, uh, 10 or 20 years, how you imagine those um, uh, shifting uh, from uh, the roles uh, from uh, U.S., uh, Russia, and China in the region. I will try to answer if Nona will let me. Yeah. I will uh, give a short answer to this question. And, uh, at first, uh, Mr. David Morris, thank you for your question. Of course, any kind of investments in the region, which has a huge potential, can contribute to stability of the region. But these investments are not happening. Not only Chinese huge investment, but also investments from the US, investments from the EU, investments from Russia, taking into consideration the potential of the region. Why? Because there are some uh, uh, military actions which are happening uh, in the region. And uh, because of the tense relations between the Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia and Russia. So for this, I am, I, I am keeping saying that uh, we must think we are in South Caucasus, so we must find ways for solving these problems. Armenia must try to find uh, ways for solving problems with Azerbaijan. And uh, after this, if we will find all uh, uh, answer for the uh, two questions and solve our problems, the huge investment not only from China, but also from the US, EU and Russia will be. Of course, uh, South Caucasus can stand also the new battlefield in, 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 in this situation 
but when we are testimony the changing world order as now we have sino russian tandem which is coming from the east and from the north and we have also in the region uh, the us and the european union which are coming from the west so 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 in this situation uh, in this situation uh, south caucasus states must uh, be also very careful uh, to not stand battlefield uh, in in this uh, during these changes uh, okay uh, well i i want to add here that uh, look um, the south caucasus countries as i mentioned they have more pragmatic views on the on the investments uh, and uh, those uh, those investments uh, should be happening uh, but they shouldn't be happening at the, inter at the expense of the national interest. Uh, so as long as uh, the national interest of the countries are not suffering through these investments and we do not, ha we do not uh, have um, uh, the political engagement uh, from China, uh, I think uh, we are open to any kind of the investments uh, and uh, well, let's see if uh, I'm not. I'm not sure that this is a destabilizing geopolitical factor, uh, and uh, Belt and Road Initiative can be uh, quite successful if uh, if that goes through uh, as planned in the region. Nona, uh, China and Georgia signed a free trade agreement in 2017. Uh, have uh, both sides taken advantage of this agreement? Have you seen uh, developments uh, and? Uh, uh, a jump in trade um, between the two countries since then? Uh, definitely. Well, as I said, mostly uh, it's coming from China because we have a lot of uh, Chinese imports into the country. But at the same time, uh, Georgia's wine sector, which is quite uh, quite big uh, and important, has uh, has benefited from the from the free trade agreement. And uh, basically, China is now the second uh, the second biggest uh, importer of the Georgian wines. I don't have the numbers immediately with me, but yes, we have seen that uh, the free trade, free trade agreement was well used by both sides. And her, do you envision uh, something similar happening in Armenia uh, in terms of uh, uh, trade or uh, free trade agreements or other types of uh, agreements uh, with China? Yeah, Armenia, uh, uh, Armenia will not sign a free trade uh, agreement with with uh, China, we will see what will happen with Georgian agreement, which was signed uh, years ago. Armenia is a member of the Russian Economic Union, and two years ago, the Russian Economic Union and and the China and China signed agreement, uh, which is providing some opportunities to 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 cooperate in multilateral uh, way, uh, in multilateral uh, uh, level as well. So we will see what will happen, but there. Are, uh, there are so little Chinese invest investments in Armenia. Armenia is very passive in Chinese direction. Uh, uh, so uh, it is also because that uh, it is also because that Armenia has no railways or uh, ports or, or uh, roads. But uh, for this reason, now Armenia is also thinking about uh, digital Silk Road, as uh, Armenia is paying great attention on. Uh, take the uh, development of technologies. So we, we, uh, we are uh, preparing some project. We will see what will happen. So uh, we will think mostly about the uh, digital silk road as we see that uh, we can work in this sphere with China. So we have a question uh, from Professor Chen and I will combine his question with another question that came in uh, from Ms. Ng. And um, uh, Professor Chen's question is, uh, and this question is directed uh, at both um, her and Nona, how is the recent clash between the Czech Republic and China being taken in your part of the world? And um, uh, another question earlier was uh, uh, about uh, the public perception um, in Armenia and Georgia and more uh, broadly in South Caucasus towards China. And uh, the question said, um, uh, what are some negative perceptions of China, particularly in the Cold War perspective, China similar to Russia in being very communist driven? And uh, I will repeat Professor Chen's question uh, where he's asking how the recent clashes between the Czech Republic and China 
are being taken in South Caucasus? Well, uh, regarding the Czech uh, Republic and uh, and China clashes, it was not uh, widely covered uh, covered in Georgia. So I have briefly seen some news, but it was it was not on the Georgian media at all, uh, and we haven't seen any statements from the from the uh, from the state officials either. So I cannot comment much about it. Uh, regarding the perception of China as the Soviet as the as the communist state, uh, well, as I said. Um, uh, we do have the pragmatic views of the Chinese investments here. We do realize that uh, China is the communist state and coming from the communist past, it is a sensitive topic. However, uh, as, uh, as I've mentioned, China is aiming at the elites. So the larger public does not really uh, view China uh, very extensively. There is, uh, uh, it, the, the, the perception is quite positive. There is no, there is no negativity in, uh, in, the, in, uh, in, in our country towards China. So uh, as long as it continues this way, I think uh, there is no danger of uh, uh, deteriorating relationships. Uh, thanks, Paula. Uh, there were no any um, information about uh, what was happening uh, between the Czech Republic and China. I, I, I mean in media, Armenian media, only several specialists who are uh, following China, Chinese news, uh, they, they, uh, they uh, know about it. Uh, but what is happening between the West and China, it is, it is very dangerous for South Caucasus as well. Uh, because uh, the republics of South Caucasus are trying to uh, find the ways for uh, keeping good relations with the US, with the EU, with the Russia and China. And if the relations between the West, the EU and China will, uh, will be escalated, so it, uh, the, the, it will be very dangerous for our states as well. And we have seen what was happened in Anaklia Port as well in Georgia, when uh, the US tried to make some problems for Chinese in investors in, 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 in this uh, port. Uh, so uh, it will be. Uh, we are uh, uh, we are watching uh, news, and we hope that the last visitation of Chinese foreign ministers to European countries will improve will improve uh, the situation, and we will not testimony the new Cold War. Um, okay, I, I'd like to comment here regarding because we've touched about, upon the Anaclia. So uh, the Anaclia decision was not related to the US-China uh, struggle. It was mostly that the Georgian government didn't want this uh, project to happen. It was mostly Russian driven rather than Chinese and American driven. So uh, Russia does not see uh, advantage in having this Anaclia port, which will be strategically uh, very important for Georgia. Therefore, uh, the, uh, the project has been uh, put on hold were cancelled for now, uh, but we do hope that this project will continue uh, and, uh, and it is a very important, uh, important project for Georgia uh, as long as Russia doesn't intervene and does not um, uh, try to um, manipulate uh, this project, I think uh, it will go through. But it was about to take goods from Europe to China and from China to Europe without uh, passing Russian territory. Uh, well, this route is, is already happening. Uh, Anaglia was an addition, an addition to this. So the Chinese would, will be traveling through Georgia to Europe, which is, uh, which is uh, actually why, why the project is happening. But I do not think that uh, it was in the US interest to stop the Chinese investments in Anaglia. It was Russia's strategic interest to stop this project. Thank you for the view from Tbilisi. Thank you. And, um, Finally, as we're coming uh, to a close and I'll ask one last question, we started seeing a bit of a debate, which is always great uh, to hear uh, differing views um, on um, subjects. And um, I must um, agree that unfortunately in Georgia, um, when it comes to uh, Anaclia Port, which ha would have been uh, quite a transformational um, project uh, for Georgia, not only for Georgia, but for the region, um, was paused uh, 
um, and it is my hope that it is paused and not canceled uh, due to what Nona has mentioned in her presentation is that a strong Georgia or a strong Armenia is not in the interests of Russia. So let me say that we only have one minute. So um, my question to you is, um, what do you think the future holds? Uh, and it's a very broad question, so you can answer as you wish, uh, for the South Caucasus. Um, and um, how do you think uh, China should support uh, that future? Good, sir. And please note that we only have one minute left, so we'll keep the answer short. For short, peace and prosperity. <laughs> You're very short. But of course, China is coming uh, into the great game uh, in the Russian uh, continent and uh, for its pivot towards, uh, towards West. It is already in South Caucasus as well. So Chinese investments will uh, give opportunity uh, to South Caucasus states maneuver between Russia, West and China. Uh, well, on, uh, on my part, what I'd like to say is that, well, uh, stability is an important component uh, for all the players in the South Caucasus, uh, for all except Russia. So, um, given that the Georgia, well, given that the Caucasus was not on the initial, uh, on the initial new Silk Road for China, it was an alternative because the initial Silk Road was going through Russia from one part and, and to Iran, from Iran through, through other part. So, given that Russia and Iran, Iran sanctions and, and the international uh, reputation, uh, the, the South Caucasus uh, became an interesting uh, region for the Chinese Belt and, Road, uh, Belt and Road Initiative as an alternative in order to bypass uh, those, uh, those uh, players. Uh, therefore, the stability is very important uh, and it is very important to all the, all the investors and all the regional players, to all except Russia. So hopefully, let's see uh, that, uh, let's hope that this, uh, the, 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 the Caucasus continues in a peaceful way and uh, our economic performances will um, improve uh, in the near future. Thank you to both of our speakers and um, I have to mention there has been quite a number of questions that came in. Of course we didn't manage to address all the questions but uh, the Asia Global Fellows and Asia Global Institute um, uh, has uh, their, you can see on your screen right now, you can reach them over social media, you can reach them through email, which is on Asia Global uh, Fellows website, and um, continue this conversation directly with the fellows. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.